I am so happy you're here. It's my first in-person conference in like a year and a half. And this is so much better than staring at that camera above my computer that says, you know, like laughing at my own jokes. Like, <laughs> aren't I so funny? <laughs> um, if you don't know me, I'm Emily Freeman. I'm the author of DevOps for Dummies and the co-curator of 97 Things Every Cloud Engineer Should Know. I'm really excited to be here with you and to share a pretty radical idea, a complete reimagining of the SDLC. Now, before we even get started, I want to be clear about a few things. It is completely possible that you've seen a talk on this already. I've been doing a little bit of a tour. If you have, there will be some overlap. I promise there's new things as well. But it is not actually required viewing yet in the industry. Very rude. Um, and so I have to sort of level set for people who have no idea what we're talking about. The other thing is I want your feedback. I need to know how this actually works. You all have such a diverse set of experiences and constraints at your various organizations and teams, and I want to see if this jives with what you think will work, and if it doesn't. You can always find me on Twitter, at EditingEmily. Most of my work centers around DevOps, and I really can't overstate the sheer impact that DevOps has had on this industry. In many ways, it built on the foundation of Agile and, and uh, DevOps. It built on the foundation of De uh, Agile to become a default, a sort of standard that we all reach for in our everyday work. That's pretty incredible. When DevOps first surfaced as an idea in 2008, our industry was in a vastly different space. I mean, think about it. AWS was in infancy, offering only a handful of services. Azure and GCP didn't exist yet, at least not publicly. The majority of companies maintained their own infrastructure. Developers wrote code and relied on sysadmins to deploy that code at scheduled intervals, often weeks, even months apart. Container technology hadn't been invented, and applications adhered to a monolithic architecture. Databases were relational, and serverless didn't exist. Everything from the application to the engineers was centralized. Our current ecosystem couldn't be more different. All that changed in a little over a decade. I mean, really think about that. Sometimes I'm just amazed that we're still standing. And more than surviving, we are thriving in this environment. Now, don't get me wrong, software is still hard it always will be. But we continue to find novel solutions to consistently difficult, persistent problems. Now, some of these solutions end up being a rebranding of older ideas. But others are a completely unique and clever take to abstracting complexity or automating toil, or perhaps most important, rethinking, challenging the premises that we have accepted as canon for years, if not decades. In the years since DevOps attempted to answer this critical conflict between developers and operations engineers, DevOps has become a catch-all term. You probably know what I mean. And there have been a number of derivative works. DevOps has come to mean 5,000 different things to 5,000 different people. For some, it's continuous integration, continuous delivery, CI, CD. For others, it's simply deploying more frequently, uh, making sure that there's a smattering of tests and security gates before you can actually release code. And for others, still, it's organizational. They've added a platform team, perhaps even a questionably named DevOps team. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> or they have created an engineering structure that focuses on a separation of concerns and leaves feature teams to manage the development deployment, security, and maintenance of their sort of siloed surfaces. Whatever the interpretation, and there are many, what's important is there isn't a universally accepted standard of what DevOps is or what it looks like in practice. I think it's a philosophy more than anything else, a sort of methodology or framework. People can then utilize to configure and customize their specific circumstances to modern development practices. The one characteristic of DevOps that I think we can all agree on, 
and that's really important to me, is that it attempted to capture the challenges of the entire software delivery process. And this is really critical. None of the derivative works were that ambitious, instead focusing on a segment of software delivery. It's that broad umbrella, that holistic view, that I think we should breathe life into again. Beyond the interpretations, or arguably misinterpretations of DevOps, there are the imitations, the spin-offs. DevSecOps was the first, and perhaps most critical, adding the ever-important ever security to the initial idea. And from there came what I lovingly call the blank ops. We have ML ops, and Git ops, and AI ops, and Dev data ops, and they just keep shoving words together and hoping it sticks. I know naming is hard, but we are better than this, guys. I'm being glib, but I believe that DevOps has fundamentally changed our industry. It is a nearly globally adopted solution. We work more as teams. We have reduced silos. We think more systemically, I would argue. And we sometimes embrace failure. Not all the time, but we're getting there. We're much better at communicating across the full process of delivering software. The challenge we face now is that DevOps, I think, is an increasingly outmoded solution to a previous problem. Developers now face cultural and technical challenges far greater than how to more quickly deploy a monolithic application to on-premises infrastructure. Cloud Native is the future, the next collection of default development decisions, and one the DevOps story can't absorb in its current form. I believe the era of DevOps is waning. That's bold. But in this moment, as the sun sort of sets on DevOps, we have a unique opportunity to rethink, rebuild, even replatform. But big shifts are hard, and I want to acknowledge that. They deserve a lot of thought. Now, when I first started to really think about this, to consider and sit with what could be next for DevOps or even replace it, I did look a little like this sad plug. <laughs> I love this plug so much. I didn't know if I would end up you know, building on the foundation of Agile and DevOps and sort of capping it off like a three-layered pyramid, or if I would end up burning everything to the ground and starting as a phoenix, anew from ash. As with most creative work, it was a little bit of both. Now, there's a balance here, right? I am not saying that we should throw DevOps away today. The technology adoption life cycle you've probably seen was created by researchers Beal and Bolin in 1957. Jeffrey Moore popularized the most common uh, diagram you've seen in his book, Crossing the Chasm. It discusses how different groups of people adopt new technology at various times. The groups called innovators and early adopters are sort of first to transition. They're excited about change, whereas late adopters are a little bit slower to action, but just as important. The truth is, companies and organizations, people, they're still adopting DevOps. And that's amazing, because it's valuable, and it does increase all of the areas that we've already talked about. It helps organizations. The ideas and practices of DevOps embody the incredible potential to improve collaboration, reduce silos, help engineering teams deliver more resilient applications faster. All that is great. But I don't want to wait for the very last person to get on the DevOps train to start to leave the station and to start thinking about what's next. Continuous improvement doesn't just apply to our systems, it applies to us too. We're not exceptions here. I mean, we know as engineers that to stay relevant and honestly employed, we have to constantly learn new skills, new tools, new frameworks, all of it. We are always learning and changing. That's part of the job. That same learning culture applies just as much to how we think about our people systems as it does our software. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. That would be very handy. I'm not completely certain what the next decade of tech looks like. None of us can be sure. It's always going to be up in the air. But I do know that I can't write this story alone. I need you. I need the community 
to, to get behind an idea, to start a conversation, and to really start evolving how we run our engineering teams. I'm hoping that the ideas I present here will get that conversation started. I believe that to build on what was, we have to throw away the assumptions that we've taken for granted all this time. In order to move forward, we must first step back. The software or systems development lifecycle, what we call the SDLC, has been around since the 1960s, which is incredible to me. And it's remained more or less the same since before color television and the touch-tone phone, <laughs> yet we still use it. Over the last 60 years, we've made tweaks, slight adjustments, we've judged it, add little steps here and there. With Agile, we sort of bent it into a circle, and DevOps, we moved it into an infinity loop. We occasionally add pretty colors. But across all use cases, the SDLC has become an assumption. We don't even think about it anymore. Universally adopted constructs, like the SDLC, have an unspoken permanence. They feel as if they have always been and always will be. I think that impact is even more potent if you were born after the construct was popularized. Nearly everything around us is a construct, a, a model, an artifact of a human idea. The chair that you're sitting in now, the monitor, maybe you're watching this talk later, the desk you work at, the mug from which you drink coffee in the morning, and if you're on call, wine at night, <laughs> or your beverage of choice, buildings, toilets, plumbing, roads, cars, art, everything around you. And beyond all the modern inventions that make our lives more convenient, there are other, perhaps, more substantial examples of this. I mean, have you ever really sat and pondered why the alphabet is ordered the way it does? Is? I mean, why is A first and not P or K? That would certainly change the grading system. Why do we use a base 10 counting system, not two numbers or 60 numbers? Turns out that the culture in which we learn and live and create has incredible impact on how we think and innovate. Zero was a placeholder, a way of denoting value in a positional number system long before it was a number in its own right. To the best of our knowledge, Zero was defined as a number by Brahmagupta, a Hindu mathematician and astronomer in 628 CE. In Sanskrit, zero is called shunya, and scholars believe that this was developed out of a philosophy of emptiness called shunyata. I think that's beautiful. The invention of zero as a number was born out of the cultural and philosophical norms of India at that time. Culture the environment in which people operate determines how those same people think about and solve problems. India developed a rich environment of philosophical thinking, which enabled its citizens to think differently and encouraged invention across a number of areas. The culture that we foster in tech will have the same impact. How we think about our work has direct impact over our ability to innovate and solve problems, including in the realm of DevOps and whatever comes next. The SDLC is a remnant. It's an artifact of a previous era, one in which software security was a physical concern. You just locked the door, which sounds downright pleasant. And women were still called computers. I think we should throw the SDLC away, or perhaps more accurately, replace it. Replace it with something that better reflects the nature of our work now. A linear, single-threaded model designed for the manufacture of material goods cannot possibly contain and express the distributed complexity of modern socio-technical systems. It just can't. These two ideas aren't mutually exclusive, that the SDLC was industry-changing, valuable, and extraordinarily impactful, and that it's time for something new. I believe we can hold these two ideas at the same time, showing respect 
for the past while envisioning the future. We talk a lot about abstractions as engineers. In fact, I'll talk about it tomorrow with Ken Exner and our leadership session. And now, what we usually mean is that we're obfuscating logic or creating a separation of concerns by removing overhead from an engineer. This is because computer scientists have long used the term to mean removing certain details in order to focus on broader concepts. Especially over the last few years, with the surge of cloud adoption, abstraction has become one of these tech buzzwords that we sort of hear ad nauseum and use all the time without ever clearly defining what we mean. But an abstraction, in its truest sense, is an idea. It's a notion, a theory, and that idea is almost always expressed visually as a model. Yet even as abstraction feels somewhat technical in our world, the word model feels as if it belongs to the domain of thought leaders shouting from their ivory towers on Twitter. <laughs> I believe modern problems deserve modern solutions. And we're not going to get very far if we keep attempting to adhere exponential complexity to static models. We've been so consumed with technical challenges that we've forgotten how to think about how we think about tech. The infinity symbol, as you know, is widely used to visualize the DevOps tool chain. It's a way of more or less bending the SCLC into a loop through which companies can iterate. And this was a good step. But like the SDLC, it implies a linear flow. As in, you plan and then create or develop and then verify or test and package, build, deploy, et cetera, et cetera. The DevOps interpretation of the SDLC still does not allow for a pause, a pivot, a loop back as required. Now, I don't know about you, I have never in my life had a software project go smoothly, even when I'm the only one working on it. <laughs> Software is chaos. It's a study in entropy, and it's not getting any more simple. The model with which we think and talk about software must capture the multi-threaded, non-sequential nature of our work. It should embody the roles we take on as engineers and all the considerations we have to think about along the way. It should build on the foundations the things that came before it, like Agile and DevOps, and represent the iterative nature of continuous innovation. When I was thinking about this, I was inspired by ideas like extreme programming and the spiral model, which, if you're not familiar, deserves a look up. I wanted something that would have layers, threads even, a way of visually representing multiple processes happening in parallel. What I settled on is the revolution model. I believe this visualization is capable of capturing all the pivotal movements of software. Now, I want to give you a minute to just absorb the idea, and I'm going to dive into all the discrete elements in a moment. But I want you to just have a first impression. I call it revolution because, for one, it revolves, at least in theory. It's circular shape actually reflects the continuous innovation and iterative nature, iterative nature of our work. It's also revolutionary. I am challenging a 60-year-old model that is embedded into our daily work. Now, I don't expect Gartner to jump on this and make a magic quadrant, though that would be really, really cool. <laughs> Could be <a> great. <laughs> so you should call me. My mission with this is really just to challenge the status quo, to throw out a wild idea and see where it takes us, and to create a model that I think more accurately reflects the complexity of modern cloud-native software development. The revolution model is constructed of five concentric circles describing the critical roles of software development. You have architecting, developing, automating, deploying, and operating. Intersecting each loop are six spokes that describe the production considerations that every engineer must consider throughout their engineering work. Testability, scale or securability, reliability, observability, flexibility, and scalability. The considerations listed 
are not all-encompassing. There are, of course, things not explicitly included. But I figured that if I added 20 spokes, things would start to get really overwhelming really fast. Another question I got early on was, why is operating the smallest circle? Is it less important? No, definitely not. When I first designed this model, I looked at architecture for inspiration. The Guggenheim was one of the shapes that really caught my attention. If you've ever been in, there's a stunning circular ramp with it, many of you are probably familiar. In a perfect world, the model would be three-dimensional. It would show those sort of layers, almost like stories in a building. But any model, I believe, must maintain its meaning even in two-dimensional models and visualizations. Because of that, one of the circles had to be the smallest, and one of them had to be the largest. I chose operating to be innermost because it represents the process for me. I mean, when we're architecting, we're thinking abstractly, we're designing, we're dreaming. And as we move through the software development process, we become more embedded in the system. Okay, let's dive deeper into each element. We have long used personas as the default way to divide audiences and tailor messages to group people, essentially. Every company in the world right now is repeating this mantra of developers, developers, developers. That doesn't always work for everyone. Not everyone identifies as a developer, and that's okay. Personas have always bugged me a little bit. This approach, I think, either oversimplifies someone's work or it needlessly complicates it. I think few people fit cleanly and completely into persona-based buckets anymore. The lines over the last few years have gotten mighty fuzzy. On the other hand, I don't think that we need to delineate so clearly between very similar roles, something like a platform engineer versus a DevOps engineer, or a security administrator versus a security engineer. But I think most critically, personas are immutable. A persona is wholly dependent on how someone identifies themselves. It's intrinsic, it's not extrinsic. Their titles may change, their roles may differ, but they're probably still selecting that same dropdown from the ubiquitous sign-up form for literally anything. I was a developer. I will always identify as a developer. It influences how I think about problems, where I come from in my thinking and problem solving, even though I've done a bunch of work in other areas. In my heart, I'm a developer, and that will always influence me. Roles, very different. Roles are temporary, inconsistent. They're constantly fluctuating. If I were an actress, the parts I played would be lengthy and varied. Hopefully, because I'd be successful, right? <laughs> but the persona I would identify as would be an actor, an artist. That would stay the same. Your work is not confined to a single set of skills. It may have been a decade ago, but it is not today. In any given week or sprint, you may play the role of an architect, thinking about how to design a feature or service. You might also consider you know, being a developer, <laughs> writing a code that fixes a bug or writes a new feature. You might also act as an automation engineer, looking at how to improve manual processes that we often refer to as toil. A release engineer, deploying code to different environments, or finally releasing it to customers, even rolling it back. Or an operations engineer, ensuring that the application functions in consistent, expected ways. No matter what role we play, we have to consider a number of issues throughout each of those roles. The first is testability. All software systems require testing to assure architects that designs work, developers that code works, operators that infrastructure is running as expected, and engineers of all disciplines that changes won't bring down the system. Testing in its many forms is what enables systems to be durable and to have longevity. It's what assures everyone that changes won't impact current functionality. And a system without tests is a disaster waiting to happen, which is why testability 
is the first among equals at this particular round table. Security is everyone's responsibility, but few understand how to design and execute secure systems. I struggle with this. There's a lot of jargon in security. It's overwhelming. Security incidents, for the most part, are high impact, low probability events. The really, really big disasters, the ones that end up on the news and get us all free credit reporting for the year. It happens every year, have you noticed that? <laughs> free credit reporting for the rest of my life. Um, they don't happen super frequently, and thank goodness, because you know there are endless little vulnerabilities lurking in our systems. Security is something I think we all know that we should dedicate time to, but we don't always make time for. And let's be honest, it's hard and complicated and scary, and if you fail at it, the consequences can be really big. DevSecOps, the first derivative of DevOps, asked engineers to move security left. And just that phrase should show you how embedded the SDLC is into our language. Because move security left depends on that model. This approach to security meant that it was a consideration early in the process, not something that would block a release at the last minute. This is also the consideration under which I'm putting compliance and governance. It is not perfectly aligned, but I figure all the things that you have to call lawyers for should just live together. All the suits, right there. In all seriousness, there are, these three concepts are really about risk management, aren't they? I mean, you can talk about things like identity, data, authorization. It doesn't really matter the sort of deep dive. The question is, who has access to what, when, and how? And that is everyone's responsibility at every stage. Site reliability engineering, or SRE, is a discipline, a job, and approach for good reason. It is absolutely critical that applications and services work as expected for the vast majority of the time. That said, availability is often mistakenly treated as a synonym for reliability. Instead, it's a single aspect of the concept. If a system is available, but customer data is inaccurate or out of sync, the system is not reliable. Reliability has five key components. Availability, latency, throughput, fidelity, and durability. Reliability may be the end result, but for me, it's resiliency. That's the sort of journey or action that engineers can take to improve reliability. Observability is the ability to have insight into an application or system. It's the combination of telemetry, monitoring, and alerting available to engineers and leadership. There's an aspect of observability that overlaps with reliability, which is why they're neighbors. But the purpose of observability isn't just to maintain a reliable system, though of course that is important. It is the capacity for engineers working on a system to have visibility into the inner workings of that system. The concept of observability originates in linear dynamic systems, very fancy, and is defined as well, how well internal states of a system can be understood based on the external outputs. It's critical that when companies move systems to the cloud or utilize managed services that they don't lose that visibility and confidence in their systems. The shared responsibility model of cloud storage, compute, and managed services require that engineering teams be able to quickly be alerted to, identify, and remediate issues as they arise. Flexible systems are capable of adapting to meet the ever-changing needs of the customer and the market segment. Flexible code bases absorb new code smoothly, embody a clean separation of concerns are partitioned into small components or classes and are architected to enable the now and the next. Flexible systems reduce chain dependencies or eliminate them, ideally. They have database schemas that accommodate change well and commu components communicate via a hopefully well-documented and standardized AVI. At least we should be moving there. The only thing constant in our work is change. Things are constantly shifting. And in every role we play, creating flexible solutions that will grow as the applications grow is critical. Finally, scalability. Now, scalability 
refers more to a system's ability to scale for additional load. So that's usually what we're talking about. It implies growth and a system's ability to mature and flourish over time. Scalability in the revolution model carries the continuous innovation of a team and the byproducts of that growth within the system. For me, it is the most human of the considerations. It requires each of us in our various roles to consider everyone around us, our customers who use the system and rely on its services, even our colleagues, current and future, with whom we collaborate, and ourselves. We have to read that code, too, later. Software development isn't a straight line, nor is it a perfect loop. It is an ever-changing, complex dance. There are twirls and pivots and difficult spins, forward and backward. Engineers move in parallel, creating truly magnificent pieces of art. The issue is, moments of pure magic and artistry, the moments when we are our best, most put together selves, are fleeting. The prima ballerina falls in practice, sometimes during the show as well. The first chair violinist, a literal concert master, plays the wrong note. Your tests don't pass, your code doesn't compile, your work silently errors, it fails in production, everything's late, you don't make that deadline, the PM is mad because always, <laughs> it's chaos. It's not you, it's the machine. Here's why I think everyone gets mad and everyone gets stressed. We think software development, stunningly, should be a straight line. But you know it never is, ever. It looks like that progress bar in our favorite internet service provider when it goes down during outages. It'll say something like, you'll have streaming back in eight minutes and then three hours and then two minutes and then maybe two days, you know, who knows. <laughs> We continue to measure progress in a straight line. We talk about product launches in terms of red, yellow, green. I appreciate the Toyota production system and just how much it's discussed in DevOps circles, but we are not making cars. This isn't a checklist, and once you attach the driver's side door, it just stays there. In no car line, production line, does attaching the door break the catalytic converter doesn't happen. But your small change, that little code shift, that could bring down the whole system or create degradation in a decoupled service. You know what's happened. I am passionate about this new model and approach because I believe it will help developers in their everyday work, and that's important to me. How can we possibly teach business leaders and product owners and scrum masters and all the people around us in our work that prediction and feature delivery is a bit of a fool's errand when we use a straight line for our model. How do we operationalize revolution? Now, I don't exactly think that this model will look what it looks like in maybe six months a year. In fact, I would consider that to be a little bit of a failure. I want your experiences and opinions to shape this. I want it to evolve. But I have some ideas to think about how revolution could look in practice. Think about developing a small feature. All the edge cases you have to consider along the way. Let's say Ahmed, a developer, is implementing a new sign-up form. That's super easy, right? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's one of those things that you think is easy, and then it's not. He utilizes a front-end library for the form and is developing a service in the user class to validate inputs. Using test-driven development, or TDD, he writes tests to meet expected behavior. He then implements code and verifies that the code works running, by running those unit tests. Ahmed was fast, and within two days, he had created a form and logic that allows users to sign up with you know, basic information, first name, last name, email, et cetera. He compiled the code, kicked off the build process. A DevOps engineer released the code to production after security and end-to-end -end tests passed. 
After Ahmed's form was released to production and to customers, a user named Li Xuin opened a support ticket. Li went by Li, two-digit name. But Ahmed had assumed that all names would have at least three characters. Li received an error every time they attempted to register an account. Amy was assigned the ticket in JIRA to fix the bug and presumably update field requirements. Amy changed the field requirements to accept single character names, which there are many. While working on that bug fix, Amy realized that the overlapping logic could be merged into one form verification method in a helper class. She made that update, documented the change, because we always document changes when we write them <laughs> for future developers, and Amy shipped the fix. Once that was out, um, things went much more smoothly. There are also other countless examples. Let's take one more, perhaps from an area I do a little bit more work. Imagine a post-incident review during which your team is trying to figure out what went wrong, what went right, and everything in between. Let's say Mike was the primary on call for this incident. Poor Mike had just had a baby and exhausted, slept through the alarm. Jose, a developer, woke up and after stumbling to the computer, read through the alert and opened the monitoring tooling. He quickly realized that something in the database was throwing hundreds of exceptions. Never a good sign. Initially, Jose assumed something had been configured incorrectly. It must have been a provisioning issue, perhaps. He continued to dig into the issue while asking others for help. Jose was able to access a graph, and it showed a spike in database activity. Thinking, he compared that graph to the changes in the application made around the same time. It's a pretty good idea. Ha, <laughs> discovered it. Just kidding. It's never that easy. <laughs> you have to go hunting again. Here's the clue. Every recent database transaction shared the same article ID. Turns out, the comments on the article exceeded the limits originally provisioned for DynamoDB. The immediate fix was set the limit impossibly high until morning when the operations engineers could properly enable auto-scaling. During the post-incident review, a few developers involved noted that there were no uniqueness constraints stored in the database. Development time was allocated in the next sprint to allow for duplicate writes. Those are just two examples. There, I'm sure you can come up with a thousand more. This map, this revolutionary model, I think gives internal and external stakeholders, including customer-facing, non-technical colleagues, the necessary context to understand any given practice and process. It's even more powerful, I think, when explaining delays, incidents, and complex setbacks. But how do we measure success? My favorite thing about this model is that it is community first. It's open source, anyone can iterate on it and make it their own. And when I first started talking about this, one of the responses I got came from a developer on Twitter. He had this idea to overlay a radar chart and visualize the confidence of various areas in a socio-technical system. When you think about how we can influence leadership decisions, and perhaps most critical, uh, budget decisions. <laughs> I think about a lot of times how many of us have influence over those decisions. Now, Evan's data has surveyed the community and found that 95% of people who identify as developers are involved in purchasing specifically developer tooling. Of those, 41% are actually authorized to make the purchase. This tells me we need to get our hands on the big credit cards, y'all. <laughs> Work on that. All jokes aside, data, I think, is one of the key tools we can utilize to influence those decisions and our leaders. I recommend data when we're trying to persuade others or trying something new. And I believe Revolution can help with this. Imagine a team that deals with a lot of reactionary work. Small-scale incidents 
that signal a brittle system. Not something really big that would get atten the attention of leadership, like, I don't know, a site going down during a big retail promotion, but the kind that initiates a lot of toil. Any reactionary work prevents the team from being proactive, from thinking about improving the considerations of a healthy application, and considering how to best meet the needs of their customers. Imagine a team that wants to make pivotal improvements to an application or even a service. The revolution model and approach is designed to be scaled up and down to meet the team's unique circumstances. At that point, you probably need to collect some baseline data in order to compare changes and see improvements. These scores, I think, are relatively generous. I would imagine most of our systems probably look like this. But let's think with hope in our hearts and be positive. Most of the data you have in here will not probably be an exact science. You might have telemetry for some of these areas and utilize it if you do. But if you don't, you can absolutely survey your engineers. They will give you interesting data. However you fill out the data in this, just make sure it is consistent across every check-in. And you will need check-ins. The reliable quantitative data and the more qualitative data from your engineers will give you a pretty good sample. You want to have regular check-ins. And don't expect massive progress or changes quickly. I certainly wouldn't expect progress in every single era, area. It's extremely common in work around reducing tech debt or increasing the durability and resilience of a system that a lot of problems you didn't even know about suddenly surface. You thought you had one problem, you have eight. When you pick up a rock in the garden, it has worms underneath it. It's the case of any team. And in this case, perhaps they found fairly serious security vulnerabilities they needed to address. When they started digging into what may have caused the frequent outages and service degradations, they sorted out that there were root causes, or considerable number of them, influencing those problems. It's always going to be a bit of a scavenger hunt, a sort of sun, fun surprise as you dig through your systems. This team did the right thing. They dedicated time to fix those security concerns. And it's always going to take longer than you think it will. Remember, one of the main advantages of revolution over the traditional SDLC is that you can show your work. And you can show how your contributions aren't a linear path. You can literally illustrate the work needed, the pauses taken, the continuous delivery of small incremental changes that, when taken in the aggregate, make big impact. Set a finite time at which you'll evaluate the work over the long term. I recommend at least nine months, um, but ideally a year. You'll probably have initial setbacks, and then work will start to accelerate from there. Output will not be linear. There's no fancy burn down chart for this, and the first few months of work are going to be slow and tedious and irritating. But eventually, your team will locate the issues, the main areas that need to be improved on, and they will set to work. Identifying the real problem usually takes longer than the actual fix. I believe the next 10 years of tech will be focused on developer experience. I am mildly obsessed with it. I mean, how do we make de development you know, better, faster, but also more enjoyable for the people doing the work? How do service providers abstract complexity without exaggerating simplicity or obfuscating observability? And how do we innovate, not just on our technology, but also how we model it? However you operationalize revolution, I want you to make it your own. I want you to iterate on it, but keep it engineer-centric. I can't wait to hear what you think about this new model and approach to software delivery. I'm excited to see how it changes and how it adapts to all the scenarios that you face in software development. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you being here.